everyone, and welcome to the Consciousness Cafe. I'm Mark Hunter Brooks, and I'll be your interviewer tonight. We're going to be talking to David Hulse, who's the spiritual leader at Heartlight Spiritual Center here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we're going to talk about the topic of speaking in tongues. Now, we said the science of speaking in tongues, but there's a whole lot more to it, and I think we'll get into that tonight. But we're trying something new. So you see we have a different background. Uh, this is the sanctuary at Heartlight. Uh, here off of Mallard Creek Road in, mm -hmm. in uh, Northeast Charlotte. So um, we're going to be speaking from here, and they, they have a great art AV setup here, so we thought we'd take advantage of it. But David invited me to come and, and do the uh, Consciousness Cafe presentation from here, so I, I'm happy to accept. But uh, I hope you enjoy seeing the backgrounds here and uh, you know listening to us as we talk about speaking in tongues. So... Uh, let me turn to David and okay, there we go. Um, David, tell us about speaking in tongues. What, what is it all about? Oh, wow. Uh, I, that's just, that's a softball shot to get you started. That's a big yes, question. Someone. Let's see what we can do to, to answer, uh, what is speaking in tongues? Okay. Well, first of all, I, I'd like to speak first of all from experience. Good. Speaking in tongues is not a dogma or doctrine to me. It was an experience uh, that transformed my, my life. Mm -hmm. I was very young at the time. I was only 17 years old when I experienced this uh, thing that was called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which in itself could really be talked about. What is that? Mm -hmm. What does that mean on a more uh, intellectual conscious level? Yeah. Oh, and, and let me add too. one thing, too, for the Consciousness Cafe members is that most of the, the spiritual experiences we talk about are near death experiences. So this is a different type of spiritual experience. So I, I hope you'll enjoy this from David. Good. Thank you. Um, it's interesting you say that because actually I almost see this as a uh, af after death experience. OK, because the old me died through this experience, and the new me was born. And how old were you? 17. Wow. Yeah. And, and how long have you been preaching since you were 17? 61 years. Wow. Now, back in those days, you didn't have to go to theology school and uh, get degrees. You just had to get the calling. <laughs> and uh, then people would ordain you. So I was kind of grandfathered in into the ministry. So I didn't get it at the cemetery, I mean, seminary. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> Freud and slip on oh, purpose. Okay. Uh, but I really did. I was a very young, introverted young man, just terrified at the idea of doing reports in school and standing up in front of people. But uh, after this experience, I just found this this uh, intensity uh, of a voice coming through mm -hmm. me that was like, whoa, who is that? And I realized it was me, but it was me at a higher frequency. It's almost like turning the TV up or turning the radio up, but everything just uh, turned up for me. Uh, I was raised in, in the Pentecostal church. I will admit that. Fortunately, I made it out of there uh, very early because of self-study research and uh, my obedience to the leadership of what I call the spirit kind of led me on my own path to, to study uh, what what this was all about, because it was a mystical experience, no doubt about it, uh, that happened uh, to me. So from that, I began, I guess, a ministry. I started going around talking to young people's groups, and different churches started asking me to come, and that has continued on to this day uh, that we're in right now. So speaking in tongues is called glossolalia, in the Greek. It's a Greek word that means the sound of language, or language is a sound. So when we say language, we think of what I call terrestrial language, mm. like English, or we speak German, or we speak Swedish, or, or we speak earthly languages, Sanskrit, Aramaic, but this is heavenly language, heavenly language. So I'd like to start out, actually, uh, if I could, by just uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of Bible, but I just wanted to read from 1 Corinthians 14 for, for our listeners that tells us, uh, and this is the writings of Paul, mm -hmm. as we read it in English. Uh, 
He said, uh, and, and it tells us, I would like everyone of you to speak in tongues, but also I would rather you prophesy. So prophesying means ministry, teaching, mm -hmm. uh, things that we do in English that has a spiritual principle to it. But he also talks about how that he speaks in tongues. And I want to give this one scripture to you. For anyone who speaks in tongues does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. Mm. They utter the mysteries of the Spirit. Mm. Now, that is exciting to me that people who allow the language of spirit to flow through them are speaking what is a mystery to the human brain. Mm. So the brain doesn't understand it because it hadn't been made conscious. Mm. That's why I love your name here, Conscious Cafe, because <laughs> it's all about what can we, from the spirit realm, make conscious right. and expand and evolve our, our consciousness. So... Um, the thing that I want to introduce tonight that I'm excited about is to take this out of a religious context as a doctrine or, or dogma into what I believe is a new therapy for people individually to use on themselves. Mm, on yourself. On yourself. You don't have to go to a practitioner. This is for you. And that's, if you really read Paul's writings, he's telling the church, uh, which Pentecostals don't do, they speak in tongues all over the place. They get all emotional and they get caught up and speak in these tongues, uh, whether it's spirit or not, they learn to do it. Uh, and we're not talking about that kind of emotional thing, but we're talking about really spirit coming through mm -hmm. and using our sound, our voice in some way to speak things that are yet a mystery again to to the to the to the mind as, as it's learned intellectually. So, um, but he says when you do uh, allow this speaking in tongues to happen, it is for your to edify yourself. Mm. So this is a way in which you can strengthen your faith. You can strengthen your spirit by doing this. So it's a private thing. It's a personal thing. Would you say it's kind of like meditation? Is Could it be something similar uh, to meditation it, in terms of a spiritual practice? Well, I think we can put it in that category. Okay. But I think it's a different experience. I think it's a step further mm. than meditation. But here's the thing. Meditation could be a prerequisite. Uh, pre prerequisite. Yes, I can't say it. <laughs> I need to speak in tongues, right? Yeah. Uh, to speaking in tongues because it silences the mind. So if you can settle down the human mind, calm it down, then you create space in you so that the spirit can speak. Wow. Now, another scripture that I think is so powerful is uh, going into speaking in tongues is a way to intercede for the need of other people. Mm -hmm. uh, because here's what it says. It says, even when, uh, when we do not know how to pray, the spirit does. So instead of me deciding how I want to use prayer to control or manipulate a situation may not be what spirit wants to do. Mm. So if I get myself out of the way and let spirit pray through me, it will always pray in alignment with the will of God for that situation. Cool. And that's why the Bible says you can pray amiss. That's actually in the Bible, mm. that all prayer is not spiritual. People just pray. Remember where it talked about how Jesus said you stand on the street corners with your garments and you do long prayers and when your heavenly father knows what you need before you prayed. Yeah. So spirit always is ahead a little bit of our, our human part of ourselves. So uh, I want to say too, that the thing that the Pentecostal people that I grew up in has misunderstood, they don't understand the difference in tongues. Yeah, I was going to ask you that, is how do Pentecostals speak in tongues as opposed to how you speak in tongues or other yeah, people speak in tongues? Yeah, this this was an embarrassing thing for me, but a great lesson uh, many years ago, because I was taught in the, in the Pentecostal church that you had to speak in tongues to show the evidence that you have received the Holy Spirit. I was taught that so much, I thought it was a verse in the Bible. Hmm. So I would quote it as the Word of God. And I was talking to a young uh, charismatic group of youth uh, many years ago, and they called me on it. And they said, where <laughs> is it in the Bible where it says speaking in tongues is the evidence of the Holy Spirit? 
I was shocked. I couldn't yeah. find it anywhere. In fact, I found that the evidence of the Holy Spirit is the fruits of the Spirit. There you go. Love, peace, gentleness, kindness, and whatever. So that was an awakening to me because they, uh, and why they call it Pentecostalism, because they believe on the day of Pentecost when they went into the upper room that they, they had a representative from all the known nations of that time. So that meant there was different languages represented there. And when the Holy Spirit came upon them, it says they, they heard every man speaking his own language. So the supernatural thing happened there was actually everybody understood their own language. It wasn't speaking in unknown tongues at all. It was just speaking in other tongues, mm. other languages. Mm. Then the Bible also speaks of uh, such things as unknown tongues, glossolalia, uh, other tongues, that's other languages supernaturally coming mm. through. And then there is new tongues. This is the one that fascinates me because I think this is what I do a lot in my teachings is I use English to bring people new concepts that they have not heard yet. So mm -hmm. it's new to them and the brain will go, I don't know if I understand that. So it's a new concept. I'm using the same language in new ways. Mm -hmm. So this is the new tongues that's yeah. coming through. Yeah. And as you're talking, I was sitting there thinking this is experiential. And so there's an intellectual part of religion uh, as well as an experiential part. But I think a lot of the mainstream religions or or the the more institutionalized religions are more um, uh, intellectually based and not experientially based. But here at Heartlight, you're experientially based. You do a lot of experiential stuff. I don't think you speak in tongues. They don't speak in tongues here. But um, there's other experiential things that kind of go along to match with the intellectual understanding. And Absolutely. I think that you need that kind of balance to really develop your faith if you're interested in spiritual development. Well, some people call it left brain, right brain. You know, uh -huh. there's that analytical, linear, uh, two always follows one, three, two. Yeah. Uh, and then there is that spiritual part of ourselves that kind of sees more, less linear and sees more visionary mm -hmm. into the divine principle, let's call it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's called many things in many different languages. It's called the yin and the yang in the East. It's called male and the female. Yeah. It's called positive and negative yeah. uh, working together. And also too, I know that with the mainline religions, they, they, and a, a lot of the Christian religions, they base everything on the Bible, but you know, with the experiences that people have in, in different religions and just in their own in spirituality, that kind of adds to your, your, the strength of your belief. I think that's something that's missing in in uh, faiths that are purely intellectually based is you don't have that experiential component to back up what you what you have or what you say. And it's it's kind of like somebody trying to convince you that chocolate tastes better than vanilla. And if you haven't tasted it, you don't know any better. But if you have, you do. And uh, you can say, I, I know, you know, that chocolate tastes better than vanilla, you know, just doing that. Although I like vanilla, too. I like vanilla bean. But uh I, I just wanted to emphasize that part with the uh, experiential component because I, I think a lot of organized religions don't have it or they don't have it to the degree that I think you have it here at Heartlight. Well, thank you for that. I, I, that's a good observation about Heartlight that I'm very proud of. Um, yeah, uh, I, this is just a thing with me. I have so left the dogma and the doctrine of the religion I was raised in, mm -hmm. which I find fear-based, sin consciousness, Mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. I left that a long time ago. But it's interesting how we can change our doctrine and dogma and belief systems because new information is coming in. But experience is experience. Mm -hmm. And I really think you really build your faith on experience more than you do uh, theology or philosophy or that type of thing. Well, and how did your experience at 17 change your beliefs? Oh, my. Well, uh, that's, that's quite a story, but uh, I have tried to, even from a, a mental intellectual level, what happened to me? What <laughs> happened to me? Uh, it was an overwhelming experience. Uh, it was so overwhelming that it was, uh, over, I mean, literally overwhelming me mm -hmm. until my body could not even hold it. The way I explain it is like my body is wired 110 and, <laughs> and the spirit came in at 220 and the body went, whoa, this is way too much power for me. I so it. I kind of give, gave, a, gave away to it. 
my whole body submitted, like every cell in my body, mm. everything just submitted to this experience that was a mystery to my brain. I didn't know what was happening to me. I just knew that this was something that was uh, beyond my reasoning uh, of my five senses that was happening to me. Mm. Now, the way I interpret that is what happened. A lot of people under this term of receive the Holy Spirit, believe we receive it because we don't have it. I think everybody has it. Mm -hmm. And I call it, another name I call Holy Spirit is higher self. Mm -hmm. So there's a part of ourself that is the spiritual part of our mind that is the higher atmosphere of our mind. But we live in the carnal or mm -hmm. human part of our mind most of the time, right? Yeah. Well, what happened to me is that higher mind penetrated into my human mind. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, I was a, I came out of the womb as a seeker. <laughs> I wanted to know the why. I wanted to understand. And I was born in a very religious family. Uh, my, my own uh, uncles and aunts and whatever were pastors and ministers of this church. And I thought, if I'm going to give my life to this, I need to know what I'm giving my life to. Right. So I became a seeker very early to find out exactly what, what this was all about. Now, what happened to you at 17 was totally different from what somebody in the Pentecostal church or, or your parents would have said, this is something you need to go through or something you need to do or experience. This was something totally different, totally out of left field. Is Perfect. that right? That's, that's a, a great uh, observation. But, because a lot of people would think it, it's part of religion, but you're saying it's totally different. This was totally experiential, totally spiritual. Yes, and this actually happened things. outside of my church, mm. even though my church was teaching this kind of thing, it didn't happen there. Mm -hmm. It happened outside of my church in a very unique situation that I was in that was nothing to do with the church at all. Mm -hmm. It was just a group of people who were coming together and doing prayer and intercession and just kind of waiting to see what the Spirit was going to do to show up back mm -hmm. in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. And there was a real movement at that time. So I didn't get it the Pentecostal style, which is pretty bizarre. Uh, you have people in each year, one is saying, let go, the other is saying, hold on, and <laughs> all kinds of stuff's going on, and they're working you up to this kind of thing until uh, to get out of there alive. You spoke in tongues just to get out of there. <laughs> you just might have made it up. So I'm so glad that my experience is so isolated from all of that. It was such a personal, intimate experience away mm -hmm. from the religion and the church. So you also had some visualizations as part of this too? Could, could you explain that or talk about that? Well, yeah. Or if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine as well. <laughs> no, I just wanted to I say to talk about it, but from, uh... from a spiritual experience perspective and with the near-death experiences, uh, people talk about the after effects, you know, which you were talking about, this changed you completely into becoming a preacher for 61 years. But uh, also the experiences are more than, than just the, the physical, the en energetic you know, a, a lot of people have visualizations and uh, images and thoughts and impressions that come upon them. And I just wondered if you could talk about that too, just relate uh, to I'm glad the commonality of it. Yeah, I'm glad to touch on that. I, I Why I'm reluctant sometimes is I don't want to come off like I'm a person that has visions every day and I hear yeah. voices every day, but I did have an experience in that particular experience. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the main ones I'd like to talk about is I was shown a heart, uh, literally a heart shape. And the heart was very, very dark. Mm -hmm. It was like I was looking into a, a something that had no end to it, a, a, a deep pit mm -hmm. of some kind. And all of a sudden in that heart, I began to understand that this heart was my old human heart where a lot of human uh, issues were like things like jealousy, mm -hmm. envy, uh, lust of the flesh, uh, anger anger, big yeah. one, fear, all those kind of things were in there. And all of a sudden, in the very center of that, uh, mark one of the most illuminating little tiny white hearts showed up. It was so tiny, mm -hmm. but it just pulsated with light. It was made of light, I guess. And uh, something said to me, this is me. Uh, who's me? Yeah, I believe it was the Christ seed, mm -hmm. the, the God seed was planted into my human consciousness. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing about that, that set me on a trajectory for my minister. It said, feed me. Mm. And I realized most of the preachers I've been around were feeding 
mm -hmm. uh, people's what's wrong with them, feeding that they're sinners, that they're everything that's wrong about them and the world. And they weren't feeding that uh, nourishing, that new heart that mm -hmm. was in there. So I, instead of teaching fear and sin, I started teaching love and growth and fullness of stature. Uh, one of the great scriptures uh, that was given to me, one of the first ones that I ever ministered was Ephesians 4. It says, we come to the fullness of the stature into the yeah. fullness of Christ, being no more tossed to and fro by, uh, as children by every wind of doctrine, but growing up. And I thought, oh my God, there's growth. I don't yeah. just have to uh, accept Jesus and, and get saved and just wait to die and go to heaven. But actually I'm here on a journey to grow and to mature and to become all that God has called me to be. Yeah, I, I think that's good to draw that differentiation between guilt and fear and then the positivity, the the nurturing and the encouragement of people, you know, to mm -hmm. do that spiritual walk, because I really feel like that your spiritual walk is really what you're here for here on earth is you're here for your yeah. spiritual development. You're not here to become a captain of industry or uh, <laughs> the fastest person, you know, in track and field or, or, you know, a particular sport or something you're here to develop spiritually. Now, what happens to you in life uh, is part and parcel planned, but I think the thing that, and this is my personal belief, what determines your spiritual maturity is how you choose to respond to that. I, I like to say we have no control over what happens to us. I think that's where you have predeterminism, as some people might like to say, but we have yes. total control over how we choose to respond. Choose to respond. And, and how we choose to respond is a measure of our spiritual maturity. So I'd like to say that uh, in the 60s, at that age, it was a challenging time okay. anyway, just to be that age. But, uh, and the way that I, when I look back and think, how did I make it through that? I mean, I had no religion or denomination or church behind me. It was just me thrown out there by myself. And I think, how did I make it? But I believe it was because of this gift of tongues that I kept strengthening and edifying myself. Mm. The, to go through all of the stages that I went through to start developing myself a, as a ministry. So did you use it as uh, therapy for yourself? We were I, talking about therapy, and, I, or we will be in a little, in a little bit. And that's what I'm excited to kind of get on. We can just do that for a few minutes here yeah. as what science is saying about speaking in tongues. Okay. So this totally takes it out of the religion, out of uh, the whole context of what speaking in tongues has been. Uh, you know, in the past, Pentecostals kind of believed they owned the speaking in tongues thing until the 70s. And then in the 70s, something happened that was quite a sovereign move, uh, let's say, of spirit called the Great Charismatic Movement. Mm. And what happened then is by some sovereign act, people outside Pentecost started receiving this gift of speaking in tongues. Catholics, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, and begin to form what's called the charismatic movie of the, move of the 70s and 80s. Baptists mm -hmm. were speaking in tongues, and all of that was going on, which was a whole different experience than what the Pentecostal was. Mm. But now we're in a third time in which now I believe that speaking in tongues through science is becoming a technology. I love it. Now, you had a screenshot that you wanted to share with us, too. I do. Is that, I do. Can we segue so, to that real quick? Yeah. So we're, we're putting this up on the screen for people to see. And I'll let David talk to you about it. All right. These are brain scans of people speaking in tongues and not speaking in tongues. Um, and how the brain affects the rest of the body when tongues is coming through. So I got a lot of information here, but I'm going to, I'm going to summarize okay. it into the fact that what, what they have proved is when a person is actually experiencing the glossolalia or the spirit coming through the brain, it's not coming from the same place in the brain that we speak, uh, the language we know. Mm -hmm. It's coming from a completely different place in the brain. The New York Times has covered a recently published brain scanning study of five individuals speaking in tongues and experienced no disgustful idea where someone appears to be speaking in an incomprehensible language over which they have no control. Mm. So it's, it's coming through the brain and not coming from the brain. 
Mm -hmm. So if you look at these uh, pictures uh, and the scams, you will see that what it is affecting is uh, very much in the right and left cerebral hem uh, hemispheres of the brain. It also, science have found that through the, these brain scans, the speaking tongues, we find chemical changes going on in the brain. Mm. And one of the main ones that's exciting that I found is anxiety has changed. Mm. Isn't that exciting? What all these studies have repeatedly found is that contrary to popular belief for those who believe speaking tongues is not experiencing uh, uh, something real, but a form of psychosis, uh, that this is not true that actually speaking in tongues is measurable and significantly different from other religious uh, experiences such as singing, chanting, meditating, or praying. Got it. And that's why I couldn't put that in the same category because this is a little beyond mm. those things that we do. Uh, here at Heartlight, we sing songs. Oftentimes we're in control of what songs we sing. We put them up on the, on the screen so people can see it. But in some of the services I've been in the past, people would just, songs would just be born out of, mm -hmm. through them. And they weren't hymns. They weren't written down somewhere, but they actually was coming uh, from the place of the spirit. So this is an amazing experience that we actually can affect uh, the, the double C-shaped uh, part of the brain, which is called the caudet, I had to look it up, nuclei mm -hmm. of the brain. And But what's important about that, that it is uh, something that affects the neurology in the brain mm -hmm. and moves us and changes everything uh, that has to do with storing memory, visual information, emotion, and also everything including such things as Huntington's disease has all been affected by people speaking in tongues. So you're saying this this could be very well be a good form of therapy for people. And I was sitting there thinking about uh, hypnosis. I think we have a hypnotherapist on the line uh, that that's one way to train your brain or whatever, but speaking in tongues could be another way. Or in could a, be. another different it could way. Be. I'm not saying it's the only mm -hmm. one way, right? But it is certainly a way that, for me, uh, because I get, I have times in what I do here where I get um, bogged down, mm -hmm. you know, with responsibilities and trying to come up with messages every Sunday and teachings every Wednesday <laughs> and that, podcasts that I do. I do a lot of things. That is kind of. And different. sometimes I get overwhelmed. Yeah. And sometimes if I just get still and just do the tongues inside of myself, mm. I start refreshing myself and the cortisol level starts coming down. Mm. That's what they prove that you can change your cortisol level. Let me read you this. Another study found 80% of participants who speak in tongues had greater emotional stability and less neuroticism mm. or ego, we would call I love it. it. I love it. So it starts diminishing that ego, individual, separate self, that pseudo self, and brings us back to the true self mm -hmm. that we were created to be. And tongues can be very beneficial in doing that. I love that. Now, do you know people, secular people who may be speakers in tongue therapists or whatever? I mean, how could you do speaking in tongues therapy if, if you were someone who was interested in it? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm a practitioner. As you know, I uh, I do uh, I developed a company called Soul Energetics, which does uh, vibration therapies uh, using tuning forks and sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, you you've been doing that for like twenty years. You were doing it before anybody else was doing it. Well, I was out there alone for a long time, about twenty three years ago. Yeah, I started uh, using uh, vibration, and the reason I think that I do vibration is it cuts through all the defenses of my ego mind. Mm my belief systems, all of my stuff that I've accumulated that I perceive with, it goes through and vibration goes to the core. Mm. So it's something to work from the inside out, whether trying to fix the outside so the inside's better. I love it. I think we got that backwards completely. We flip cause and effect totally in mm. that way. So yes, uh, if people come to me and, and they're open, um, I'm more than glad to go into a spiritual place and let spirit speak to their spirit without the brain being involved. Mm. I also uh, have a group here at Heartlight at times where we do intercessory prayer. And that means we pray for the planet, let's say. Maybe that's what we were 
pray for. Well, I don't know how to pray for the planet. Uh, I know what I think it should be, but somebody may have their own thought what they think it should be. Yeah. So we're praying against each other. But if we just get out of the way and let spirit pray the divine will of God through us, then we'll always pray in alignment to what is the highest and best. I love it. Cool. <laughs> so this, uh, I, I want to say to you that I really admire you having me talk about this. It seems like it's been given to me to talk about the more controversial things that other people don't want to talk about. And that's kind of my specialty is to take on these things that people just kind of uh, push, you know, under the rug somewhere and don't want to deal with it. But uh, I think there's, we've entered such a wonderful place in consciousness. We're ready to receive much higher mm -hmm. understanding of what it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah, no, I, I think a lot of people are seeing a change getting ready to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there may be people who have said over the past generations, you know, even in the 1800s, early 1900s, that there, there was a time for change coming. I know with the New Thought Movement back in the late 1800s and early 1900s with theosophy and uh, spiritual, or was it uh, Christian science and uh, all these other things that they were thinking there was a, a, a new change coming, but there's a, a lot of people talking about another change coming this time as well. Now, people's going to always ask me, how do I, if I'm interested at all, how do I receive this experience? The first thing you have to do, you have to open the womb of your mind. I call it the womb of your mind. Okay. In other words, willingness. I am willingness to receive an experience I may not understand. I'm uh, an experience that I may not be able to totally control. I'm giving my control to God and I'm trusting through faith that God through me will bring forth an experience that will edify my faith. Once you open it up, then you can receive because it won't come where it is not open to receive. Mm -hmm. I have a line that says, uh, the nature of the Holy Spirit is I thought you just might want to know. <laughs> So not everybody wants to do that. But if you're out there, and you want to do that. I say in the shower, when you're alone somewhere, riding in the car, just open your mouth and just let sounds just start coming out. Mm -hmm. And it'll challenge your brain because the brain says, I don't know what's going on here. I'm not in control of this. But I think that anybody can do that uh, on themselves. One more thing, if we could just do this, Good that I think point. so interesting, because I've been fascinated and studied DNA for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. I've done DNA activation work, and I do tuning forks and in whatever. But I'd like to read something to you that called the language of junk DNA. We all know that we only use about 30% of our genetic material. 97% was considered junk DNA, which was left over, they said, from evolution. It means nothing. Well, that's all changed now. And they're saying that a lot of answers to uh, getting rid of diseases and whatever is in that junk DNA. But what is so interesting that it says, and I quote, 90% uh, of, of the DNA is junk and it has been known to have no use or function, but as, a, uh, but as usually uh, an inconvenience. The fact that 97% of DNA is junk uh, is important for us to understand through the collaboration between molecular biologists, mm -hmm. cryptoanalysis, which are people who break secret codes, Ooh. Yeah. linguists, people who study language, and physicists, here it is, has found strange hints of a hidden language in the so-called junk DNA. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so I know people will ask you about that in the Q&A. Good. Bring it so, up. And, and before we go to Q&A, I know we're talking about speaking in tongues, but we haven't asked you to speak in tongues. So uh, just to let people know how it is, if it's okay. Uh, I don't. You can't, you, have to, you can't turn it on. You can't turn it on and off. No. Okay. I have to get into a state of gratitude uh, is a wonderful entrance to it. Uh, a state of praise. Uh, oftentimes I need uh, the assistance of vibration. So I might use, we got sound bowls around right. here. As you see, right. we use bowls here. Uh, there's, there's many instruments around here that that does sound, but I could use a tuning fork. Mm -hmm. You know, we have specific tuning forks like the Ohm tuner uh, that helps me get there. And this is maybe a little meditation, contemplation. So there's kind of a recipe that you have to follow to get to the state 
which you create that space for it to start flowing through. So I can't just turn it on like a light switch and say, I could, I could just sit here and just do tongues because I, yeah. I've learned right. what it is, but I don't want to do that because it, it's not the real deal. Right. No, that's, that's good. That's good. And, but I did want to ask beforehand, since that's what the topic was tonight. <laughs> Sure. So I, I think now's a good time to open the floor up to Q&A and see, it, see what people online may have to say, questions they may have to ask. So I'll, I'll ask Leslie if she'll kind of control that for us since we're out of the, the Zoom uh, or away from the Zoom computers right now. Well, thank you, Mark. Yes, anybody who's interested in asking a question, if you please raise your hand. And to do that, if you'll look at the bottom of your taskbar, um, you can go to reactions. And there's a little bar that says raise hand. And as you raise your hand, I will call on you in order. And of course, if you would prefer to ask the question through uh, the chat, I will be more than happy to do that, uh, read that question as well. Well, while we're waiting for people to gather their questions, I, I wanted to make an observation. I'm a shamanic practitioner. And uh, within that realm, we talk about soul songs. And those are the songs that spirit uh, gives you that uh, emanates power. So I thought it was very interesting that I'm seeing some similar or hearing some similar similarities. Uh, Jim, I believe you have your hand raised. I don't think I heard this comment. Uh, when you are speaking in tongues, if somebody's listening to you, they don't understand what you're saying. But as the speaker, do you understand what you're saying? I do not. My brain would be no different than any other brains that were available there. It's just not something the brain understands. Uh, it's beyond our understanding as we know understanding intellectually. Uh, but really, uh, what I tried to say in the beginning is it's best not to speak in tongues publicly around other people necessarily. The only exception that I see in that is when I do intercessory prayer with a group, and uh, then the tongues will come forth and we're praying for something specifically uh, like that. But no, I don't know what I'm saying. But uh, the, the, the teaching is this, that if you're in a situation like in a community or a group or congregation and tongues comes forward, it's because you know there's an, someone with the gift of interpretation. So the real deal is not to speak in tongues because nobody understands what you're talking about anyway. But when you speak in tongues, it could be a message from spirit to the, the, the group. And there are those uh, that have the gift of interpretation of tongues. That's one of the gifts in the Bible mm -hmm. is interpretation of tongues. So, for instance, I've been in services where tongues would come forth and it would be followed by somebody in another part of the room and say, and, and yea, God would say unto thee. We knew that a message was coming through that we could understand, and that, would, that works together fine. But uh, Paul is very clear to tell us that... Uh, it doesn't do much good just to come together and start speaking in tongues. It is, again, an individual thing for edifying you, mm -hmm. your faith. So it's, it's a good self-technology to help you to, as I said, bring down cortisol, take, bring down anxiety, and bring down all of the things of our hu human self that gets a little strong sometimes and needs to be balanced out. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, I believe you have your hand raised. I had two questions. First of all, have there been brain scans done of people who were speaking in tongues who are kind of the group you're talking about who are not really doing it for edification, but they're doing it more uh, because it's the thing to do? Because I've been in those kind of groups and I was not very impressed. Um, but I just wanted to know if, what kind of what kind of what what the brain's doing during that and secondly um where is a good place to get more information about how to learn how to become more familiar with this and because uh, i've read about the um the importance of frequencies in getting your uh kind of getting you in line with 
being open spiritually, uh, you know, like with your tuning forks and stuff. Um, uh, have you got stuff we can read or look at, or listen to or whatever to, to learn more about this stuff? Well, I got a whole pile right here in front of me. Uh, but here's the thing. If you will just uh, type in uh, glossolalia or speaking in tongues, science of, you will find. There's a wonderful uh, 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 video from ABC that did a study on speaking in tongues. Quite, mm -hmm. It was very thorough research, and it showed people just speaking in tongues and those who were really uh, coming through a different part of the brain. And that's how they can tell in the scan. Is it coming from the brain? Then somebody's just making it up and making noises. But if it's coming through the brain from a different part of the brain where language mm -hmm. is not registered, they had to come up with, yes, something is happening here of a more spiritual or mystical uh, uh, level. Yeah. And I, I think the uh, the citation for that report that was done that David was talking about, that was done by Dr. Andrew Newberg at the University of Pennsylvania Medical Center. He was a neurologist. So uh, if you look for Andrew Newberg, you might find some other things as well. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, Daniel asks, uh, your description of being plugged into a higher voltage sounds a lot like a Kundalini experience. Can you expect, can you comment please? Uh, like your age 17 experience may have been a Kundalini experience. Oh, well, definitely. I, I, I've never heard of such a thing at 17 years old, but yes, it did do something to open up. How do I say this? Uh, I believe we have energy centers. A lot of people call them chakras, but they're just uh, data banks. They're places where we bank our, our human story. Uh, and I think what happened to me that put me a little further down the path at 17 was the speaking in tongues and moving it through my energy centers up the spine, which is what Kundalini does, begin to open those channels and made me able to start bringing in information. Uh, the thing that I began to be known for was a revelation minister. I got revelation. I'd read the Bible, but I'd get a revelation. It wasn't what the Bible said literally, but it was the revelation behind it. And I think the fact that I could see it from these different dimensions of consciousness in myself was because of the speaking in tongues that had opened up all of these channels mm -hmm. in me that was now able to, uh, to filter in information from a much higher uh, level. So uh, that's a very good question. Uh, thank you. So Joan asks, are you familiar with white language? Might speaking in tongues uh, be the same or similar? Yes, that's an excellent question. There, there is something out there called light language that is a specific uh, teaching that I'm not so familiar with, but I will say that what I'm talking about is truly light language because spirit is light. And it is, uh, light is data or what I call photon data or information. And so therefore, I do think that it is spirit uh, for enlightenment. So that's how I see the light as enlightenment that is coming through. So yes, I think it's the language of angels, if you want to go there. I think it's the language that angels speak to us. Uh, it doesn't have to come down and be caught in the concept of our human belief systems. Uh, we get a more pure reading from uh, guides, angels, and maybe people from the other side who says that they don't communicate with us uh, in a language that is beyond the language that they learned while they was in the body. But they're actually coming through us in a spiritual uh, language of, 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 of light. So uh, I say yes. I, I like the term light language, angel language, spirit language, heavenly language, God language. There you go. So, um, Bill, in just a moment, I'll get to you. Gina uh, states, hello, David. She's asking, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, are you saying when we receive messages from our higher self, could it be similar to talking in tongues as a way of giving a person a message? Yes, I think that's very well put. Uh, I do believe that my higher self uh, is transcendent of everything that the brain holds in the sense of five, the five senses. So everything that I have brought in as a, as a perception 
uh, through belief systems and things I've studied and all of that intellectual, I think above that is a part of my uh, consciousness, a higher atmosphere that can communicate with me much differently than that lower part of my, when I say lower, I'm talking about frequency. I'm talking about the lower frequency, the higher frequency. So the higher the frequency, the language comes through to the to a match frequency in your mind. When spirit matches the mind, then you can receive in a more pure form rather than bringing it down and saying, okay, do I believe in it? If I believe in it, then I perceive the belief as this. So it loses in the interpretation. But when it's pure spirit to spirit, nothing is lost in the translation. And I think this is what's happening right now. Why there's so many people getting these aha moments or uh, these uh, what they call um, epiphanies. Epiphany is spirit, higher self, penetrating the human mind, giving it to the pineal gland, the pineal gland changes it to a chemical and the brain gets it and we go, aha, I get it now. Mm. So uh, some wonderful things are happening to us who are understanding this from a multidimensional state of consciousness rather than just a linear uh, consciousness. Yeah. So sorry to interrupt. You're making me think of a question, okay. if you don't mind, is um, all these sounds that people hear, some people may think they have tinnitus, but <laughs> Could it could it be you know heavenly sounds oh or spiritual God. sounds as opposed to just their ears ringing? I love that question. I love that question. Of course, anything like that that people are experiencing, we we encourage you to go to a, a professional and to see what's happening. Because if it's a physical situation, you might want to uh, look at what uh, the medical uh, can offer you about tinnitus. But uh, absolutely, I have a lot of people come to me uh, that the doctors can't find anything. There's no real diagnosis for it. So I'm very suspicious at that point is new frequencies coming in from higher dimension and into our third dimensional anatomy. I call it five dimensional, mm -hmm. but call it what you want to, but it's coming in uh, to us at a much higher frequency. And of course, the first thing that you're going to receive is just a sound. Also, when you stop, if I stopped right now, we got really quiet, we would hear a high pitch. Everybody does. And that's your nervous system. That's the sound of the nervous system. So it's the nervous system that's being retuned right now from these old 3D human bodies into a more resurrected human body from a different higher frequency. And that's where the tuning forks and things that are just vibration so help us to do. So yes, I think in many cases that people are having a more spiritual experience with these different kinds of sounds and frequencies that are coming through. Again, the brain just doesn't understand it. All it hears is just the sound of it retuning the nervous system. Mm. So Gina would like to say that she wants to thank you for who you are and what you do, and she loves your classes. And uh, thank you, Gina, for those comments. Bill, if you'd like to ask your question. Yeah, this I just want to restate the first question, but since we've been discussing it, because I almost forgot I asked it, <laughs> um, the um, I want to add to it. So first, um, have you seen any brain scans from of people who are, I'll say the Pentecostalists, so use an example, who are speaking in tongues, but not really doing it from as the highest, I guess, motives possible. And to add to that, let's say you get a different kind of scan than you did from the people who are genuinely tapping into um, a higher source. Um, is it possible from that point to take a look at, um, let's say if somebody, like Mark was saying, if somebody hears uh, sounds or is having experiences that are um, uh, either mystical or they're generated because the person's got psychiatric problems, is there a way to tell by the reaction of the brain how genuine the experience is and, and which type of experience it is? Does that make sense? Uh, 
Yeah, I'm not sure I can give you a total. Uh, I mean, you understand the question, though. You... You're warning. Uh, again, I'll go back to the what the scans have shown is the difference who is just kind of emotionally making it up and yeah. just doing it themselves. It'll show it's coming from a different part of the brain uh, rather than the real experience of of, of the spirit language, angel language coming through is from a completely different set. Uh, I think that you can find most of this online if you just type it in. I think there's just a lot of research that's available right now uh, on this subject that would, could uh, show you the very difference between the two experiences. And of course, to us, uh, and I say us as human beings, and the human brain, it, it just appears to be mystical. It's just mystical to us. Mm -hmm. It's really, uh, it's really helping us to uh, undo the mystery in us by bringing it forward into a state of consciousness. So uh, I'm not sure that's the exact answer you want, but uh, yes, I think uh, do your research. If you're interested in this subject, see what's out there, see what's available. Uh, to you, and I think you'll be surprised how much is out there on this uh, subject. Thank you. Uh, Luna asks, how do we know if what is coming through while speaking is our true spirit or higher self and not a negative entity? Okay, well, that is called developing your discernment. <laughs> I have learned a difference in my belief system and my knowing system. There's some things that's totally based on a belief. There's other things that is almost an innate knowing. And when this comes through you, you will know something is happening that is beyond the, the control of your brain. You'll just know it. Uh, and that's where the experience comes in. And I don't know how to define the experience. Experience is just an experience. But for me, I experienced that something definitely that didn't originate in me the human part was coming through the human part and I just had this knowing that my life was going to change now I don't even know what that meant in my in myself I didn't even know what I believed about what was happening to me I just knew something life-changing was happening to me so I think my answer is uh it's a knowing in the core in the heart uh rather than just the head uh, that something is really happening. You you feel like something's coming through you is very different from something that's coming from you. Mm -hmm. So this is where the gift of discernment comes in and intuition and guidance comes in. So David, are, would you recommend a course if I am wanting to improve my uh, discernment abilities, my intuitive ability abilities? Are there exercises I might contemplate? I think that's just a great idea. <laughs> I think we should develop some courses and some classes on this subject that we could offer to people to assist them uh, toward having uh, this uh, uh, this uh, availability to this dimension and level in themselves. I think it'll change and transform our lives. You know, the scripture, uh, one of my favorite verses is we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. It's, it's the mind that's going to do this thing. Spirit, God, whatever you want to call it, uses the mind. Now, to me, the mind and the brain are kind of two different things. They're not the same thing. The mind is a part of the heart and the soul that's different from the brain. So uh, when we let that mind be in us, uh, that was in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2, 4. I like that. Let the same mind be in you as in Christ Jesus, who th thought it not robbery to be equal to God. One of my very favorite verses in all the Bible tells us mm -hmm. to let that mind, that means that mind is in us somewhere. We just have to allow it uh, to come forth. So uh, yeah, uh, this is kind of a, a new thing I'm doing here. I usually don't talk about this subject because people are not comfortable with it. And I again, think, uh, thank you so much, yeah. Mark, for doing this and stepping out and allow me to kind of feel if there's an interest at all in this, because I would love to put together more of a uh, classes or teachings to help people how to fine tune themselves mm -hmm. to receive this experience. Yeah. And and just more on a general level too is experience is a whole different thing from intellectual understanding. Okay. And a lot of people can just go through their lives with just an intellectual understanding of 
spirituality and have an experience and have something totally different mm -hmm. come up in their lives. Just like you were saying at 17, you had one experience before 17 and another experience after that. And it was that 17 experience that changed your whole life for 60 some years. Absolutely. It opened the door. It's amazing. It opened and the door. Just, oh, I'm sorry. No, I'll just say it just opened the door to have access to the higher states of my consciousness or higher self, yeah. I call it. And it's a lot of things that people with near-death experiences say is that the after effects that they have after their near-death experience, and they yeah. have a totally different outlook on life. They could have been atheistic, you know, before their experience and be spiritual afterwards. It's just that has made such an impact on their life. And I think speaking in tongues, uh, any other of the other spiritual experiences that you have, it do does totally change the way you look at spirituality. I love that, what you're saying, because that is my experience. I don't think looking back, I would have stayed in the religion in which I was raised. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't comfortable with it. It was too uh, hell bent. Mm -hmm. It was too sin consciousness. It was very judgmental. And I wasn't resonating with that. So after receiving this experience, I had a different relationship with what I call God or higher power or whatever that I would have had through the church, see, through their dogma and their doctrine, then I would have looked at everything through that lens, but I didn't have that lens at 17 years old. Mm -hmm. So I was so vulnerable and so open and so fresh and so new that spirit could just begin to teach me right off before I had to do away with all the stuff that was coming my way. So what would have happened if you had not had that experience at age 17? How do you think your life would have shaped up? Well, in my personal experience, I probably would have been bitter because what I was dealing with in my uh, personal human life would have not fit religion at all. Mm. And therefore, I would have not received anything from the teachings other than self-loathing uh, low self-worth, uh, not good enough, because I knew I couldn't live up to these uh, old dogmas yeah. and doctrines of Old Testament law and and all of those things that they were making so black and white and this and that mm -hmm. and whatever. I've always felt like I'm kind of in between the black and white and the gray areas. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of developed a ministry in those gray areas to try to fill in you know, there's a place the Bible says, who shall stand in the gap and make up the edge? Mm -hmm. And I think I said at some level, I will stand in the gap. Yeah. And and I'm happy to hear you say that it's all positive, you know, and, and what you say is nurturing and, and encouraging as opposed to fear and guilt yeah. and sin. Yeah. And I think that's a huge difference in the way people should think about spirituality, um, you know, in, in the way they do it for themselves. And spirituality is an individual thing because it's based on your life experiences and your spiritual experiences, spiritual practice, as well as your intellectual understanding. And that brings me back to anything that will edify you and strengthen you because you're walking this path pretty much individually. Even in here at Heartlight, uh, we're not a large congregation, but we're a very unique congregation. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of people with different backgrounds here from Catholic to Baptist to Islam. no belief at all to Islam to you name it here and and uh we we all come together but we we connect we connect in that experience of what brought us here dogma didn't bring people here dogma would have taken them away mm. but it was their experience with that essence of themselves that has drawn people uh together and i really like the diversity uh, that we represent and, and if you don't mind if i i ask you one other thing too is how to join heartlight you just fill out an application you don't have to agree to anything. No. Is that right? And I Absolutely. thought that was that was different from a lot of other religious institutions. Yeah, we have no catechisms. We have no classes you have to take to prove yourself. You don't have to sign something saying, uh, I believe the way Heartlight believes. But we recognize that you are an individual, individualized expression of the one spirit God. And therefore, God is experiencing the uniqueness. If you were born Baptist, then that's the experience God wanted. If you were Catholic, that's the one God wanted. Pentecostal, that's the one God wanted. Even if you're atheist, that's the one God wanted. Because this, we are God experiencing itself in the human story. And we have to accept that diversity and the uniqueness of how spirit shows up in, in, our, in our stories. So, David, Mark, thank you so very much. We've got a couple of questions 
Bill, would you like to ask yours? Yeah, you know, again, I have two questions. Uh, so first of all, uh, if you decide to develop materials on how to um, reach this higher self more effectively, would you like lists of uh, people who are interested in that? Um, the other alternative is just to notify Consciousness Cafe if you do it, and we can get back in touch with you there. And the second question, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second. Um, and so let's say I'm coming from the old, uh, real conservative Christian um, perspective. And because you're a, a completely sinful old guy um, who, who really can't be right, have there ever been, have there ever been any times when you, you, the intuitive part of you felt you were right when you realized, when you learned later that you were not? In other words, is, is the discernment thing, is it completely infallible or do you have to watch out for it? Well, yes, I have had times. Uh, I'm always open for correction. Uh, I correct myself all the time because as new information comes to me and resonates, then it kind of changes what I thought it was. So I see consciousness as a progressive evolutionary journey. So yes, that has happened, but you got to remember, I've been doing this for 60, over 60 years. So at some level, I guess I've developed a part of myself that I, I've learned to trust. I, turn, I, I trust my discernment. I trust my gut knowing uh, system uh, because I've spent my life, I've never had a secular job. I've done this all my life, full time. And this is my life where other people go to jobs and work. I, I research and read and pray and meditate and study. So I've had, I've had the luxury of having that life uh, so young from that. So uh, that's what I would tell you uh, basically uh, about that. But yes, okay. I think we always should check ourselves. I think we should never get into a place where we feel absolute, that this is the absolute uh, way or the absolute uh, truth. I think that we have to be progressive. I think we have to take the responsibility to step back and observe ourselves. I'm a great believer in the observer, the observer of our of ourself and our thoughts and our thinking and our belief systems. Yeah. And uh, I think that's a, a way to cultivate it and make this almost like an art, an art of discernment. Getting back to the first question, if you, if you, if you start a blog or a newsletter or any kind of process to start developing, um, eventually developing materials to teach this, uh, will you keep us posted? Absolutely, I will. Be more than glad to. And, and you have a podcast too. I do have a podcast every week called From Sin to Zen. And this podcast has been developed to help people who's kind of outgrowing their religious dogma, but want to remain spiritual. And so I've taken my journey and put it into this podcast to kind of help people as to what I went through at that point, uh, where I, when I first discovered that uh, sin is not original uh, blessing is not sin, that that's a doctrine. Uh, you know, it kind of threw me. So I had to go through a lot of process of restudying, uh, being willing to let go of old beliefs. So, uh, that, that is one podcast. Another podcast I do with another gentleman here at Heart Life, who is a, uh, a very advanced music uh, person. And we do on sound vibration. And we talk about the different codes of frequencies that may open up, such as the keys to the kingdom or David's keys that he played to Solomon to drive the, the bad spirits away. So uh, we, we do try to uh, bring all of that. And those are available uh, on uh, the Heartlight, uh, 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 Heartlight charlotte.org you can get a lot of things that we download and record here at heartlight thank you david uh paulina i believe you have a question paulina hi hi everybody um Hello. david i have a question um 
to work backwards. Why do you think we develop the frontal lobe? I think um, it's really interesting for me the story of Babel, in which we separated ourselves. And I think it has to do with what you were saying about diversity. But um, I'm always, I think as a child, I was always interested to know why would what God wanted us to not understand each other, you know? <laughs> and um, I would like to know what you think. Well, I think, uh, I think uh, community is more interesting to me than church. <laughs> I have a whole different idea on the church. Uh, people think they get up every Sunday and go to church. I say, no, you go to the building. You are the church. Yeah. People are the church. Uh, and I think we got that backwards. But I think why I'm saying that to you is I think the fact of a real community of diversity coming together, that we need to share our stories, our backgrounds, our culture, our experiences uh, in culture, uh, that we can find each other. You know, I, I don't buy into this idea that uh, humanly we're all one. We're not, we're different. And I think embracing the difference is the oneness that we're all looking for instead of trying to change everybody to look like us and think like us and look like us. And I think that's where we're failing in such things as uh, race, even gender, that type of thing. We all have this idea that for everybody to be one, they have to be like me. Well, I really don't uh, because I have a unique story to tell. And I think if people would let me tell my story, my true story, and not hide it under some kind of religious uh, dogma or doctrine, and people do hide under it. Preachers hide under it a lot. I used to travel with preachers mm -hmm. back in the day, the old tent revival preachers in the South, and most everything they were preaching against, they were doing. <laughs> I learned that very early. The more they preached against a certain thing, they were most likely doing it uh, on the side. And I think because people can't be authentic and people hide themselves in religion, uh, that they build up to the point that they end up getting themselves into a lot of trouble. So I guess what I'm trying to say to you is I think it's uh, about authenticity. It's about me being able to tell my story uh, without going through what religion expects of me. Uh, I went through that in the early part of my ministry because I wanted to be what, what is the role of the preacher? What is a preacher going to look like? What's a preacher going to sound like? What's a preacher going to be? You know, and, and I did that for a long time and I was miserable until I finally started finding communities such as Heartlight and other uh, more metaphysical communities that said, we're not judging you, be who you are and let me learn from your story. It's not my story, but it's your story. And it's from you, I can learn about a part of, of humanity that I'm not experiencing. So I hope in some way that helps you with, uh, with I didn't hear all the question, uh, but that's what I wanted to share with you. Paulina, did you get, are you good? Okay. Um, Daniel uh, comments, I love what you're saying about spirituality without dogma or doctrine, asks, have you ever studied Swedenborg? Can you comment on his information? I have touched into Swedenborg uh, through the years, uh, read some of his things, and so appreciate, uh, he was a true, one of the pioneers, I think, into more deeper uh, spiritual teachings at a time that it probably wasn't very uh, popular. I think they still have what they call the uh, the, the church, or uh, there's still groups of people that meet and, and uh, study Swedenberg's uh, teachings. Uh, yes, very interesting, deeper principles uh, for that time. Uh, I'd like to draw the group's attention to two links that I put into the chat. One is to the website for Heartlight, and the other is the podcast link to um, uh, Sin to Zen, okay. if anybody is interested. All right. So you can get uh, to Heartlight. Uh, we, do we do Sunday morning services here. Uh, we look like a church on Sunday morning a little bit, but I told them this Sunday, I think that we're, we're uh, a mothership disguised as a church 
uh, ready to take people to a new frequency. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not what we appear to be sometimes, but we do have singing and music and sound and uh, and that type of thing. Wednesday is a, a class that we do. Sometimes when I can't do it, Mark steps in and does my Wednesday morning class for me and does a great job with it. We just finished up a series on reincarnation. What is it? Uh, do we believe in it? How does it affect our life? And that is finishing up this Wednesday. So you can do that at heartlightcharlotte.org. That's heartlightcharlotte.org. Now for the podcast. Oh, she's got them. I thought she asked me for them. No, okay. no, no. I've got them. Yes, I put them oh, in. Oh, good. Well, thank you. I'm so glad that you do. And uh, please uh, tune in on uh, some of these and tell some other people about it. it would be great and share it. And if I wanted to, I can, uh, since I'm not in Charlotte, I could uh, share your, the meeting via Zoom? Yes. Okay. Sure. By live stream on the website, Sundays and Wednesdays. You can share it? No, I mean, you can dial into the website on Sundays and Wednesdays at 11 o'clock. No, and you'll you, can just, you can just tune in to the classes, but we don't uh, have a way of communicating. Okay. With people yet. Maybe we should look into that. Mark, are those, uh, Mark, are the uh, classes archived so you can listen to the past classes? Absolutely. There's a lot of stuff on heartlight.org. So again, I want to thank you, Mark, for having me and, uh, and, and, the, and, and all of you out there. You've been wonderful. Your questions have been wonderful. Uh, and I thank you for your openness uh, for this subject, because I do think it's a subject that can bring you to an experience that can help to transform you if that's something that you want to uh, pursue. Yeah. And I want to thank everyone for dialing in tonight on the Consciousness Cafe and listening to this presentation with David. And I hope you all have a, an interesting evening and an interesting week. I hope this has impacted your life and, and made you think differently about different things. So with that, I'd like to uh, say thank you and take care and have a good day. Thank you.